This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silenced them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 121, Emrick Osuna. When an unresponsive nine-year-old boy died shortly after his arrival at a hospital in Boise, Idaho, it was obvious there was nothing natural about his death. Emrick Osuna was severely emaciated at barely 40 pounds and covered from head to toe in extensive bruising. Police discovered hours of footage from nanny cameras set up in the family's apartment that sealed the fates of Emrick's killers. Eric and Monique Osuna, Emrick's father and stepmother, were both arrested. Monique was accused of systematically torturing Emrick for months, forcing him to exercise for hours, beating him with various objects, and withholding food while the rest of the family ate in front of the starving boy. Eric was accused of watching and doing nothing while his wife tortured his son to death. In this episode, we also hear from Irene Zepeda, Emmerich's maternal aunt, who told me about some of the challenges Emmerich faced and shared her favorite memories of her beloved nephew. This is the unimaginable story of Emmerich Osuna. Before I get into today's story, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Yvette M. from Morrisville, Pennsylvania, Virginia B. from Fresno, California, Natalie T. from Easton, Pennsylvania, Amy D. and Hattie M. from The Other Side, and a very special thank you to Christine M. from Northboro, Massachusetts. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your support. Your pledges go a long way toward helping me devote myself to the podcast full-time, and I can't thank you enough. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. I apologize again for my voice. Since I had a cold a month or so ago, it still hasn't come back completely, so if I go in and out of sounding hoarse, that would be why. Emmerich's story is not for the faint of heart. What this little boy suffered through, especially in the last several months of his life, is going to be hard to get through on both my part and undoubtedly yours. Like I always say, though, if these kids have to endure this horrific treatment, the least we can do is hear about it and, with any luck, learn from it. Now, let's get into Emmerich's story. On the evening of Tuesday, September 1st, 2020, Police discovered nine-year-old Emrick Osuna unresponsive in apartment B202 in the Rushmore apartment complex at 1001 West Broadway Avenue in Meridian, Idaho. According to a news release by the Meridian Police Department, Emrick, who was not breathing and had no pulse, showed signs of extreme abuse. He was severely malnourished, dehydrated, covered in bruises, and had vomit leaking from his mouth and caked in his hair. First responders performed CPR on Emrick. He was rushed to St. Luke's Meridian Medical Center, from where he was quickly transferred to St. Luke's Children's Hospital, less than 20 minutes away in nearby Boise. Hours after arriving in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, at about 1.30 a.m. on Wednesday, September 2, 2020, Emmerich was pronounced dead. Emmerich's stepmother, 27-year-old Monique Desiree Rodriguez Osuna, and his father, 29-year-old Eric Emmanuel Osuna Gutierrez, were arrested the same day. They appeared in court via video conference on the afternoon of Thursday, September 3rd. When the COVID-19 pandemic began in March and schools closed as a result, Emmerich's stepmother, Monique, began working from home. Emmerich, the target of Monique's abuse, was unable to escape her wrath. Ada County Chief Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Tamara Brooke Kelly said, Due to COVID, she's been working from home, 
and since he was not in school, she essentially had access to him all day long. Prosecutors told the public that Emmerich suffered horrific torture for months at the hands of his stepmother and father. Monique allegedly admitted to striking her stepson with various household items, including a belt, a dog leash, a back scratcher, a wooden spoon, and a frying pan, as well as kicking him in the groin. She switched from the belt to the dog leash, Kelly said, because it was heavier than the belt. In combination with this physical abuse, this defendant admitted to what is essentially torture by locking him in a small closet at night to sleep, withholding food, making him do physical strenuous punishments while she was working. Emmerich had been forced to perform grueling physical exercises for extended periods as a punishment, only allowed to stop when Monique took a break from work. Reportedly, these exercises included jumping jacks and wall sits, which we've seen in other cases, such as those of Alex Hurley and Zymer Perkins. Neighbors reportedly told police they heard shouting from the Osuna's unit. The Department of Health and Welfare would not comment on whether anyone had reported possible abuse of Emmerich or any other child in the Osuna home. While arguing that the defendants did not deserve bail, Prosecutor Kelly told Judge Kira Dale, The little boy had bruises all over his body, specifically on his buttocks, groin, legs, and torso. Some of the bruises were extremely large and essentially covered the back of his body. The other children in the home were reportedly in good physical condition. The prosecutor told the judge, Those children are witnesses, and by the nature of the abuse, are in danger if she has access to those children. Monique was booked into the Ada County Jail on a charge of first-degree murder. Her husband, Eric, was accused of knowing about the abuse and failing to intervene. Eric told police that Emmerich was given nothing but water and rice for weeks prior to the boy's death. Prosecutor Kelly said, He admitted he did nothing to save his son. Although text messages indicated the couple knew by 5 p.m. at the latest on September 1st that there was something seriously wrong with Emmerich, they took no action for over four hours until they ultimately called 911 at 9.39 p.m. to report Emmerich was not breathing. Eric was initially charged with felony injury to a child, felony infliction of great bodily injury, and concealment of evidence, a misdemeanor. He was also booked into the Ada County Jail. The concealment of evidence charge came about, prosecutors said, because after dialing 911, Eric took down some nanny cameras that had been installed inside the apartment and gave them to a woman to dispose of. After Emmerich's death, police recovered the cameras. The prosecutor told the judge that Eric should be considered a flight risk because he was in the U.S. illegally, was not employed, and had few, if any, ties to Idaho because most of his family living in the U.S. was located in California. Judge Dale set bond for both Monique and Eric at $2 million each, although Eric would be unable to bond out due to a federal immigration hold. Monique's two children, aged nine and four years, and the couple's shared child, who was four months old, were taken into protective custody by Idaho's Department of Health and Welfare. A no-contact order was issued for all three of their surviving children. Their grandmother told KTVB that the family would try to get custody of the kids. A vigil honoring Emmerich was held on the evening of Friday, September 4th, in the parking lot of the Community Council of Idaho building in Caldwell. Attendees at the vigil included Joel and Samantha Hager, whose son was best friends with Emmerich. Samantha remembered Emmerich as a boy who loved getting a sugar rush before running around their house engaging in Nerf gun wars. He always asked if he could stay longer at their house, both Joel and Samantha recalled. A group of women from Emmerich's school also attended the vigil, holding each other in a tearful circle. Also in attendance were the police officers who responded to the apartment on September 1st to assist Emmerich. To memorialize Emmerich, his family in California also held vigil for him nine evenings in a row, one for each year of Emmerich's life. They lit nine candles and gathered near a tree, covered with and surrounded by photos of Emmerich, praying for God to keep Emmerich by his side and for their family to be at peace with their loss. Emmerich was born on October 16, 2010, and lived in California for most of his life. His father was in and out of the picture for the first few years of Emmerich's life. In January of 2012, Emmerich's mother, Cecile Siglali Lucero, wrote on Facebook, I hate fathers that call themselves dad when they are not even in the kid's life or support them. A father is a father when he is there to love them. 
I consider myself a mother slash father. I love my son so much, Emmerich. Cecile did appear to love her son very much, frequently posting photos and comments about him on her Facebook page over the next several years, during which she gave birth to another son and then a set of twins, a boy and a girl. Emmerich was an absolutely beautiful baby who grew into a handsome little man with big brown eyes, dark hair, and a wide, sunny smile that he loved to share with everyone. In December of 2017, Emmerich was removed from his mother's custody, separated from his siblings, and placed into foster care because then 26-year-old Cecile was arrested and accused of intentionally causing injuries to her 13-month-old twins by torturing them. Prosecutors in that case said the abuse was severe, resulting in multiple bone fractures and bleeding in the brain. Cecile, who was pregnant with her fifth child at the time, was charged with assault on a child by force likely to produce great bodily injury, resulting in paralysis, two counts of torture, and child abuse. This came about after she slammed the baby girl's head into a metal bed frame until the baby, who I'll call JB, was unresponsive. Cecile then asked a friend to take her and her daughter to the hospital, where she told staff her daughter fell in the bathroom. Not believing her story, staff at UCI Medical Center contacted Santa Ana Police, who performed a welfare check on the other children and discovered that the baby's twin brother, GB, had suffered injuries consistent with abuse, including skull and rib fractures. The two older children, including Emmerich, appeared unharmed, although relatives claim he too was abused by his mother. Baby JB underwent surgery but was left partially paralyzed. Doctors also found she had suffered a broken elbow that was already beginning to heal. When interviewed by Santa Ana police investigators, Cecile admitted that she was already upset about her unplanned pregnancy, and after her live-in boyfriend left for a Christmas party, she slammed her daughter's head against the metal pole of the bed frame. She admitted she was jealous when the twins' father doted on the babies instead of paying attention to her. She told police that her 15-month-old daughter would dog her by giving her a look that indicated the baby wasn't afraid of her mother. Cecile also confessed that she had kicked and dropped her daughter. She was held in the Women's Central Jail facility in Santa Ana to await trial. The twins were placed into the custody of their biological father, but Emmerich was placed into foster care. Emmerich lived with his aunt, Marie Osuna, in her Orange County home for a while. Marie later told KTVB7, He was just like one of our own. He loved us. He would call me mom. He was just a good kid. He was happy. I just don't understand what happened. Several family members, including Emmerich's maternal grandmother and a family friend, were willing to take Emmerich in, but as usual, CPS and the family court system pushed for reunification with his biological father. Despite Eric not being present for most of his son's life and living in a different state, he was deemed a priority for reunification and ultimately awarded custody. On March 2, 2018, Eric filed for a divorce from his wife, Melissa Iglesias. The couple did not have any children together, and the divorce was granted by default just over one month later. At some point, Eric met and began a relationship with Monique Rodriguez, and the couple and their children moved to Boise, Idaho in April of 2018 when Emmerich was seven, where they were homeless for a time, living at a homeless shelter called Interfaith Sanctuary. Marie, who called Emmerich her little tub-tub, said that after her nephew left California, We trusted both of them to take care of him, and it's not like our family wasn't more than willing to help. They could have reached out to us. They could have said something, you know, if they were frustrated with him. Why would they starve him like that? It's just food. What did he do to deserve to be starved or even to be hit like a dog? He just needed love. He just needed love, that's it, and to feel safe. Through her tears, Marie said, We're sorry that he had to go through that pain. We will always love him. Eric was ultimately granted permanent custody of Emmerich in February of 2019. Eventually, Eric and Monique married, and in the spring of 2020, they had a child together, the fourth child in their blended family. One of Emmerich's uncles, Francisco Tirado, created a GoFundMe campaign to raise funds to bring Emmerich's body to California for burial. That campaign ultimately raised almost $11,000. A second campaign also claimed to be raising money to return Emmerich to California, created by Antoinette Edwards, who wrote in the campaign description that she was a friend of Emmerich's mother. That campaign raised just over $3,500. 
Ultimately, the family was able to have Emmerich's body flown home. His casket was loaded onto the plane by members of the Meridian Police Department. On Wednesday, September 23, 2020, a funeral was held for Emmerich at the Fairhaven Memorial Park Mortuary's Waverly Chapel. Some investigators from Idaho were in attendance. Some mourners dressed in superhero or Transformers costumes in honor of Emmerich, while others wore white at the family's request. Some carried flowers, white balloons, and doves, which were released beside Emmerich's white casket. He was buried at Fairhaven Memorial Park in Santa Ana, California. Emmerich's headstone reads, Emmerich Osuna, October 16, 2010 to September 2, 2020. Below a color photo of Emmerich wearing a winter hat and holding a heart-shaped chunk of snow, in Spanish is inscribed, My son, how sad and painful it is to remember that you are not in this world. However, knowing that you are with God in heaven, singing and enjoying, I find relief from my sadness. I'll be right back after a word from my sponsors. Greetings from the Bluegrass State. That's Kentucky, if y'all didn't know. We want to tell you about the hottest new podcast on the block, Coffee and Cases. If you fancy yourself an at-home detective, if you find yourself yelling at the TV during that new true crime documentary, then you, my friend, are a certified sleuth hound. Just like us. On Coffee and Cases podcast, you'll hear about the missing, the murdered, and the unsolved. But the cases you've rarely, if ever, heard about. All from the perspective of two teacher friends, rule followers, and self-proclaimed scaredy cats. Join me, Allison, and me, Maggie, each week as we take on cases that are often overlooked but are screaming for justice. Finally, a true crime podcast where you don't have to monitor the foul language. Coffee and Cases is a true crime guilty pleasure that you don't actually have to feel guilty about. Check out Coffee and Cases every Thursday for a new episode on your favorite podcasting app. At a court hearing on October 1, 2020, Prosecutor Tamara Kelly added a hefty new charge to Eric's list, felony murder. In Idaho, for a defendant to be guilty of felony murder, the state has to prove that the murder was committed during the perpetration or attempted perpetration of one of a list of horrific crimes, one of which is aggravated battery on a child under 12 years old. If convicted, both defendants could face up to life in prison or, if the prosecution decided to pursue it, the death penalty. At a hearing on Wednesday, February 10, 2021, an evaluator testified that Eric was not mentally competent to stand trial, although his specific mental issues or diagnoses were unknown. Under Idaho law, a defendant must have the mental capacity to understand court proceedings and to assist in his own defense. KTVB7 reported that Idaho does not have an insanity defense under which a defendant could be found not guilty by reason of insanity. When someone is ruled incompetent to stand trial, he is generally held in county jail, a state hospital, or an Idaho Department of Corrections facility where he will receive treatment for his mental health issues. During treatment, if evaluators determined he had regained competency, his case would move forward. Eric and Monique's preliminary hearing before Judge Daniel Steckel on March 31, 2021, stretched from 8.30 a.m. past 6 p.m. Eric's commitment was ordered terminated, and although it wasn't explicitly stated in the court docket, based on my inexpert interpretation of Idaho Code Section 18-2124, it appeared the judge determined him to be competent, because the proceedings in his case resumed. In fact, the judge bound over the charges against both Eric and Monique Osuna to district court. At the same hearing, the prosecution detailed for the court the repeated beatings and torture Emmerich endured before his death on September 2, 2020, presenting evidence that included nanny cam videos taken from the family's video surveillance system. Several witnesses also testified at the hearing, including an Ada County paramedic, four members of the Meridian Police Department, and Hannah Berry, one of Monique's co-workers. Some of the testimony I'm about to discuss is very graphic and difficult to hear. Hannah testified that while discussing Emmerich's behavior with Monique, Hannah suggested the possibility that the boy suffered from reactive attachment disorder, which affects neglected or abused children. 
Monique took Emmerich to doctors, who told her, Hannah said, He was a fine kid. At that point, Hannah told the court, she suggested the couple install nanny cameras in their apartment to document Emmerich's reported behavior. She was also the one to suggest physical exercise as punishment, but she insisted she did not recommend the lengthy bouts of exercise Monique forced upon her stepson. Hannah said that on September 1, 2020, at around 5 p.m., she received a text from Monique that said something was wrong with Emmerich. When she arrived at the apartment around 8.30 p.m., Hannah said, Emmerich was lying on the living room floor. He was laying down and he was covered in blankets. I mean, it looked like he was sleeping. Emmerich's hand was cold to the touch, she said, and at some point, she suggested Eric and Monique put Pedialyte into Emmerich's mouth with a syringe, which they did. She suggested they try to stand him up to see if that roused him. When they lifted Emmerich, Hannah said, he took his last breath. It was a deep breath, and then it was just silent. When Monique performed CPR on her stepson, Hannah said, a milky liquid sprayed from his nose and mouth. Finally, around 9.40 p.m., Eric used Monique's phone to dial 911, placed the call on speakerphone, and before paramedics arrived, handed Hannah a bundle of security cameras and cords and asked her to hide them in the car. Hannah testified that when she returned to her car hours later, she remembered the cameras and turned them over to police. While initially talking to officers at the scene, she testified, panic led her to forget about the cameras. I was still in shock. Those cameras captured multiple videos that were shown during the preliminary hearing. Emmerich appeared severely malnourished in all of the video clips, his ribs protruding sharply against his skin. Some of the videos documented the hours of constant physical exercises Emmerich was forced to do as punishment, which included wall sits, jumping jacks, inchworms, and others. In one video, Emmerich did a wall sit as Monique loomed over him, screaming profanities and threatening him with physical violence. In another, Emmerich was performing another exercise in the kitchen when his father came into frame and appeared to hit the nine-year-old in the back of the head with a belt. Throughout the videos, Monique was seen kicking Emmerich across the room, calling him a fucking loser and a piece of shit, and telling him she was going to force him to eat his own feces and drink his own urine. One video depicted Emmerich asleep in the fetal position on the living room floor without blankets or pillows. Suddenly, Monique woke him by grabbing him by the hair, yanking him off the ground, and forcing him into the kitchen, demanding he perform jumping jacks. All the while, she was slapping him violently before switching to beating the crying, screaming boy over the head with a spoon while he tried to protect himself from the object. Some video footage depicts Monique holding Emmerich by the hair and swinging him around like a rag doll. Feel free to pause the episode at any time to grab a glass of something very strong or scream into a pillow. Meridian Police Detective Matthew Farinato testified that during the video in which Monique awoke Emmerich and yanked him up by the hair, she was furious with him for drinking a glass of water supposedly belonging to someone else. The little boy asked to use the bathroom, which Monique forbade, telling him, Next time I'll put poison in a cup and put your name on it. In one 12-minute video seen at the hearing, Emmerich was performing an exercise in the kitchen when he paused and moved toward the garbage can, possibly hoping to look for something to eat. Monique was seen on the video entering the kitchen, kicking Emmerich before hitting him multiple times in the head. In another video, Emmerich was hit with a frying pan while being forced to stand on one leg with his hands above his head. There was one incident on video in which Eric was seen hitting his son with a belt. Eric's contribution to the verbal and physical abuse of his son appeared less common than his wife's, but Detective Farinato said that Eric often ignored Emmerich and failed to intervene when Monique beat or berated him. In another video, Eric approached Emmerich who was unconscious on the kitchen floor after hours of forced exercise, and woke him to tell him to continue exercising. Reportedly, while the videos were shown, Monique became emotional in the courtroom, and Eric hung his head. Meridian police detective Eric Stoffel also testified at the hearing, saying he interviewed Eric after Emmerich was taken to the hospital on the evening of September 1st. Eric admitted during the interview that in the weeks leading up to his death, his son was hit with a dog leash and a frying pan. When the interview concluded, Detective Stoffel said, he told Eric his son had died. The detective testified, he said he had failed as a parent. And the winner for understatement of the year goes to Eric Osuna.
How much exercise was Emmerich forced to complete? Detective Farinato testified, Each day, I would say over 12 hours a day or thereabouts. Sometimes it would go on 20-plus hours of constant exercise. The detective also testified that throughout the footage they reviewed, which encompassed the two-week period leading up to Emmerich's death, not once did they witness a single member of the family show affection or any kind of positive attention to Emmerich on video. He was not permitted to play with toys or games. While the rest of the family ate fast food in front of him, Emmerich went without. When the rest of the family went to bed at night, Emmerich was either forced to sleep in the hallway closet, or he simply curled up on the living room floor like a dog. The court saw autopsy photos during the preliminary hearing, showing extensive bruising on Emmerich's face, head, back, and legs. Investigators testified that in separate interviews with Eric and Monique, when asked if, in their belief, Emmerich was tortured, both conceded that their treatment of the little boy qualified as torture. According to Eric's statements to police, on the morning of September 1, 2020, Monique hit Emmerich twice with a dog leash before giving him some rice and water, which he threw up. After taking a shower, Emmerich was forced to stand on one leg. Eventually, he was allowed to lie down on the floor. Throughout the afternoon, it became more and more apparent to Eric and Monique that something was very wrong with Emmerich. After 5 p.m., Eric texted Monique that they needed to take Emmerich to the hospital and Face it. If you don't want to, that's fine. I'll go. I know you're scared. I am too. Around the same time, Monique texted Hannah Barry. Around 8.30, Hannah arrived at the apartment. Meridian Police Officer Scott Frazier, one of the first two officers who responded to the Osuna home on the evening of September 1st, testified that when he arrived, Emmerich was on the carpet with his head toward the door without a pulse and not breathing, so he and the other officer alternated performing CPR until EMS arrived. Monique, he said, was crying and frantic, while Hannah Barry and Eric appeared stoic. Officer Frazier testified that the boy appeared sickly, as if he had a long-term medical condition. He was very emaciated. He appeared ill. His eyes were sunk into his head. He was pale. When he asked Monique for Emmerich's diagnosis, she said he had ADHD. When EMS arrived, the officer said, they stripped off Emmerich's clothes as they treated him, and they saw that Emmerich had substantial, dark bruising from his buttocks to his lower back, as well as trauma to his penis, describing the injury as appearing as if someone had left a rubber band wrapped around it. Ada County paramedic Jana Reed testified that she found it unusual that nine-year-old Emmerich was wearing a diaper when she arrived on the scene. When I asked why he was in a diaper, I was told he kept wetting himself, so I put a diaper on him. She testified that Emmerich was unresponsive, with vomit caked in his hair and around his face. Within 20 minutes, paramedics were able to get his heart beating, at which point he was rushed to St. Luke's Hospital in Meridian. After being transferred to the pediatric ICU at St. Luke's Children's Hospital in Boise, Emmerich died. The court also heard testimony from Detective Joseph Miller who interviewed Monique while Detective Stoffel interviewed Eric that evening. Detective Miller said his interview with Emmerich's wicked stepmother, my words, not his, took around five hours. Initially, Monique told the detective that Emmerich was injured while playing rough with some neighborhood boys, but she eventually admitted she had been abusing Emmerich since the beginning of the year, saying the abuse escalated after the birth of her daughter four months before Emmerich's death. During the interview, Detective Miller testified, Monique admitted delivering repeated beatings to Emmerich and forcing him to exercise for hours at a time as discipline. The day Emmerich died, however, Monique told the detective, she hit him fewer than ten times. What a benevolent soul, right? She admitted to hitting her stepson with a leash, a back scratcher, a wetted belt, a wooden spoon, and a frying pan, and she said she beat Emmerich with the pan every other day for several months. Detective Miller testified that Monique took responsibility for a good portion of the abuse, including the constant exercises Emmerich was forced to do, although Detective Stoffel told the court that Emmerich also performed exercises while Monique was out of the home and only Eric was present. She said she thought it would teach him a lesson. She said she was harder on him. She said she lashed out at him, hitting him with a pan and making him exercise while she worked, and that he only took a break when she took a break. According to Detective Miller, at the end of his interview with Monique, she was arrested. He had testified that he did not read Monique her Miranda rights before their interview, 
but she was read her rights before a second interview at the Ada County Jail, during which she told a similar story. Prosecutor John Dinger asked, Did he spend his last night alive in the closet? Detective Miller replied, He did. The other three children who lived in the home, including an infant, did not appear to be abused, according to police. At the conclusion of the preliminary hearing, Judge Steckel ruled there was enough evidence for the charges against Eric and Monique Osuna to proceed to trial. A month later, both defendants pleaded not guilty to the charges against them. On November 4, 2021, Eric filed for a divorce from Monique. Now, for another quick word from my sponsors. A surprise update in January concerned not Eric and Monique's murder charges, but the child abuse case against Emmerich's mother, Cecile Saglali Lucero. Cecile had been in jail awaiting trial for her multiple charges after beating her infant twins and nearly killing her daughter all the way back in December of 2017, when she was seven months pregnant with her unplanned fifth child. On Friday, January 28, 2022, Cecile pleaded guilty to one felony count of assault resulting in comatose state or paralysis of a child younger than eight and one felony count of child abuse and endangerment. Along with her plea, Cecile admitted to sentencing enhancements of causing great bodily injury to a child younger than five. Cecile's plea deal ensured that in exchange for her guilty plea, her two felony counts of torture were dismissed. For the injuries she inflicted on her daughter, J.B., which included a brain bleed and partial paralysis, Cecile was sentenced to 1,496 days of imprisonment, which equated to the time she had served behind bars since her arrest. She was also sentenced to four years for her attack on J.B.'s twin brother, G.B., which left the baby with a skull fracture and broken ribs. Apparently, the sentences were ordered to run concurrently because Cecile was released from jail shortly thereafter. Back to Emmerich's case, at a plea hearing on the afternoon of Wednesday, February 16, 2022, 29-year-old Monique Desiree Rodriguez Osuna pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder of her nine-year-old stepson. In exchange, the death penalty was taken off the table. In a statement written by Monique that was read at the hearing, she said that at first, Emmerich was a sweet little boy that fit in really well with our family. After a while, though, Emmerich started showing concerning behaviors, so she began punishing him physically. Unfortunately, my discipline of him escalated. Before I knew it, I was abusing him, and that abuse killed him. Monique detailed in the statement how she forced Emmerich to exercise as punishment and beat him to make him continue. He wasn't getting enough food to keep up with the exercises I was making him do. On September 1, 2020, Emmerich got very tired and fell asleep before he went into cardiac arrest. The prosecution intended to recommend a sentence of life without parole. As part of Monique's plea deal, she agreed to waive her right to appeal her sentence. A month later, 31-year-old Eric Emmanuel Osuna Gutierrez also pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in exchange for the death penalty being withdrawn as a potential sentence. A sentencing hearing was held on Thursday, June 9, 2022, at which both Monique and Eric were present. Meridian Police Detective Eric Stoffel testified at the hearing that what hit him hardest about Emmerich's abuse and murder was the fact that the videos captured the nine-year-old talking to God in the middle of his torture. One morning around 3 or 4 a.m., the detective testified, Emmerich was being forced to exercise when he suddenly stopped and asked God why the abuse was happening to him. The detective said, He starts crying. That was one of the most significant instances that affected me. As he's talking to God, you can see Monique in the background and sneak up to where she's hiding behind the counter, listening to him. That affected me the most. Deputy Prosecutors John Dinger and Tamara Brooke Kelly played almost 20 grainy black and white video clips from the family's nanny cameras, the sounds of Emmerich's abuse and the profanity-laced yelling of his stepmother echoing through the silent courtroom. In one video, Monique said to Emmerich, You're on my shit list for the rest of your life. The rest of his life lasted only eight more days after that video was recorded. The video depicted Monique telling Emmerich to eat something off the floor, taunting him and asking if he's hungry before saying, You better shit in your hand and eat it. To this, Emmerich replied, But mom, I don't want to starve to death. How heartbreaking that he called her mom and she still had the nerve to do this to him. 
Throughout the videos, Emmerich's emaciation became progressively more apparent as his ribs and spine protruded beneath his skin. While the videos played, Monique kept her head down and her hair in front of her face, not watching the footage. She occasionally made small noises, reached for tissues, and wiped away tears, which I'm positive were not shed for Emmerich, but for herself. Also shown in court were autopsy photos of Emmerich, in which his body was covered with purple bruises that spread over his buttocks, genital area, thighs, and arms. Dr. Matthew Cox, pediatrician for St. Luke's Hospital, testified that Emmerich weighed 41 pounds when he died and that he had been starved. He was wasted, skin and bones in appearance. Ada County investigator Melanie Yamada Anderson testified that in the nanny cam videos she watched, Emmerich was seen exercising for up to 20 hours at a stretch. She said the family pets were treated better than Emmerich was. He ate out of the garbage can or dog food. When he was caught doing so, the investigator said, he was beaten and punished. The videos showed Emmerich always slept either on the floor with no pillows or blankets or in the hall closet. Monique often woke him in the early hours of the morning just to beat him. Another video showed Monique telling Emmerich to scrub the floor with hot water and a toothbrush. While she filled the pot with water, she said, Hot water to burn the skin off Emmerich. Detectives also testified that Emmerich was given dirty water to drink from a cleaning bowl. On the rare occasions when Eric was seen on video, he sat on his phone, watched TV, or encouraged or participated in his wife's abuse of his son. Emmerich's mother, Cecile Lucero, provided the prosecutors with a victim impact statement in which she said she would never recover from the loss of her son. Cecile said she and her family loved Emmerich, but Eric and Monique did not care about his well-being. A mitigation specialist, Julia Yackel, also testified at the sentencing, saying she obtained records of Monique's life history to assist in her biopsychosocial analysis of the convicted killer. During her testimony, Ms. Yackel said that when Monique was two, she and her brother were removed from their home in California and placed into Orangewood, an emergency home for abused children. Around the time they were placed in Orangewood, Ms. Yackel testified, there were several abuse allegations in the home, and she felt that placing Monique there at such a young age would have created significant lifelong harm. During her analysis, Ms. Yackel said she uncovered several referrals that indicated Monique had been sexually and physically abused and had witnessed multiple domestic violence incidents between her parents. Monique was not treated as a child after witnessing this abuse and went on to fail at school. At 17, Monique became pregnant, but she wanted to break her family's cycle, so she graduated high school and attended college. I dug up some information indicating that Monique was at one point licensed as a pharmacy technician while living in Anaheim. Ms. Yackel testified that Monique worked with Blue Cross and that she had no criminal history but a long work history, adding, Her family viewed her as a success story. In his closing statement, Prosecutor John Dinger said, A small child was sent to Idaho to be cared for by the defendants. Instead, he was sent to a living hell. As for Monique's actions against Emmerich, he said, I don't know how you can rehabilitate this. She just simply deserves punishment. This is the most serious crime a person can commit. Imprisonment will provide an appropriate punishment. Monique stood to give a statement during the hearing, telling the judge, I know what I did was wrong. I know I can't bring him back. I can't undo any of my actions. He didn't deserve any of that. He deserves so much more, and I hope for the rest of my life I'll be sorry for my wrongful actions. In sentencing Monique to life in prison without parole, District Judge Stephen Hippler described her as sadistic, evil, and heartless. Emmerich was completely abandoned, and he turned to God. He tried to speak to God. Why? Why? She co-opted God, his last refuge. The judge ordered a 100-year, no-contact order for Monique's surviving children, all of whom witnessed their mother's abuse of Emmerich. In a statement after the fact, Ada County Prosecutor Jan Bennett said, It has been nearly two years since the senseless and heartbreaking abuse and murder of Emmerich Osuna. Emmerich was an innocent boy who did not receive the love and care every child in this community deserves. On behalf of my entire office, we extend our deepest condolences to Emmerich's loved ones for their unimaginable loss. Eric's sentencing hearing was scheduled to commence at 9 a.m. the following day. But for reasons I still don't understand, it was pushed back and is currently scheduled to take place on October 20th, 2022.
Although it has been over a month since Monique's sentencing, she is still being held in the Ada County Jail, now without bail, awaiting transfer to the Idaho Department of Corrections as inmate number 143313. I'll continue to provide updates on the case on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll be sure to post an update there once Eric is sentenced. This past weekend, I had the pleasure of speaking with Emmerich's maternal aunt, Irene Zapeta, who wants to ensure her precious nephew's memory never fades. I'm honored to be able to help Irene and her family keep Emmerich's memory alive. We'll hear from Irene after this quick sponsor break. On the show today with me, I have Emmerich's aunt, Irene. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. When was the last time you saw him? The last time I saw Emmerich was for Christmas in 2017. And he was still living in California then? He was. He went to Idaho pretty quickly after that, wasn't it, around April of 2018? Yes. But were you able to speak with him or, or keep in touch with him at all? No, I I moved. I, I, don't, I didn't live in California at the time. I just went to visit. I went home for the holidays, and that was the last time I saw him before he went to Idaho. And I didn't really have much contact with Emmerich's dad, and I didn't know that he had remarried. I had him on Facebook, so I would I stayed um, in touch with Emmerich's dad. I had him on Facebook, and whenever he would post stuff, I would um, like it and message him on um, regards to Emmerich. So he let you follow him, and did that end at any point, or, or did he just not really post a whole lot? It ended at some point. Um, uh, later, I found out that his wife was very jealous of other, other women and very, I'm not sure if possessive is the right word, but she was not comfortable with him talking to other women, regardless of the relationship. I suppose me being his ex, sister she didn't feel comfortable us having any type of communication i i found out he blocked me on social media because i was looking for pictures of my mark he kind of did have some communication with my brother um him being a man then it wasn't too much of an issue and my brother is emmerich's godfather so emmerich asked his dad to talk to my brother a lot because he was a uh, very present in his life when he was in California, Emmerich always wanted to talk to my brother. They would FaceTime and have some kind of conversation, but I believe the last time that my brother was able to FaceTime with him was a few months before he passed. He seemed like a very smart kid. He was very bright. He was very active. He was very creative, and he was the spoiled child of the family. He was the only grandchild that my mother got to raise. My sister was a single mother for a long time with just Emmerich and my mom babysat for my sister while she worked two jobs. So my mom pretty much raised Emmerich for the first part of his life until she met the father of her other children and moved to go live with him. So she doesn't have any of the uh, the kids right now? No. Do you guys still get to see them? I did see them at one point. They were all in Emmerich's funeral, so I saw them occasionally. I don't live in California, so I just see them when, when I'm there. It's hard to be in their life and not... It's very painful for my family to not see all of them together, especially for my mom, because... My mom, she she really uh, didn't get to see once my sister moved out of the house and started having her other children. My mom didn't really get to see my sister that much because she worked a lot. She was living her life, so my mom didn't really get to see her or the kids. And then my mom moved out of California, so it was my sister by herself and her kids. And everything went, went downhill from there. She didn't have the emotional support and the support of her family. And, you know, there's no excuse to anything that she did, but um, we really wish we could have been there for her and for her children, especially for the kids. Sure. These things don't just happen. So, yeah, you never know what might have made a difference. But I hope you guys don't blame yourselves. It's so hard to predict when something like that will happen or, or something, you know, like what happened to Emmerich. Yeah. yeah. 
Emmerich was very energetic. Um, I, my, I have a daughter. My daughter and Emmerich are about the same age. They were only two months apart. My sister and I are the only two girls in my family out of seven. So it's five brothers, two girls. And so we were pregnant with our firstborn together. I lived in California at the time when we both gave birth and we lived together for a little bit. And so I got to see him when he was a baby. Basically everybody, when it was just on myself and the babies, everybody thought I had twins. Did they look a lot alike or were they just super close in age? They kind of looked alike. Um, Emmerich looked a lot like his dad. He got a lot of his dad's features. Mm -hmm. But they were about the same. They were the same size. They were the same age. The only difference was my daughter spoke a lot faster than Emmerich did. And Emmerich took a little bit longer to speak. And that's when we started noticing that maybe you need a speech therapy or to be evaluated for something, learning disabilities. Unfortunately, my sister never took them and we never knew if there was something there. We never, we never knew officially if he needed special attention, which later on we, we were told that that was one of the reasons why he was being mistreated because they didn't know how to handle him. And I was like, well, <laughs> he's a child. Right. Everything that they did does not justify discipline, does not justify anything. It was torture. It was, it was inhumane, you know. And if he did have any kind of disability, it was, that was not the way to, to treat him. He, he was very, regardless of anything, he was very loving. He loved hugs. I love to hug him. Since my daughter and him were the same age, um, I would always play around and tell my, my daughter that Emmerich was my baby and she would get jealous and he loved all the attention and tell her, she's my mama. She's my mama. So he would always hug me and kiss me to make my daughter jealous. And then since he was so active, I would uh, play with him and do like a military drill. I, w- I would tell him, Emmerich, Eddie. And he was just like stand in the position of um like in the military, and he was then like he was a soldier, and then with a big big smile, and he said Eddie's, and I always remember that like whenever he would get really hyper, just Eric Eddie's, and he was just like stand in it, Eddie's, that smile is so the best memory. And you have a military background, right? I do. That's so cute that he just thought that was the coolest thing. Yeah. Yeah. My other favorite memory was when we went. I came home and I love horseback riding. And I told him I was going to take him horseback riding. I got him new boots so he could go horseback riding. And he was so excited. That was my favorite day with him. My best day ever. How old was he then? He was five. My daughter and they were both five and got on the little boots and took them horseback riding. My daughter had been on a horse before, but it was my first time. So for America, it was the best thing. He was so excited. The people there were giving him so much attention because they, they noticed how excited he was to get on a horse. And I just, that memory is forever engraved in my memory. I'm so glad he had so many family members who loved him so much. Yes, he was very loved. He was very cuddly. He was there. Like, my mom spoiled him so much. I think of anybody in my family, the most affected person was my mom. She couldn't even bear to go to, you know, because she didn't want to be there to see. It was an open casket, so we got to see what they left of Emmerich. And that was, that was not the little boy that we remembered. He was the, chunky little kid and we saw this tiny skinny person that we didn't recognize it was just very hard for her she had to go to the hospital because she had an anxiety attack and she doesn't even like having pictures in the house because she breaks down she's still in denial she won't go to the cemetery i've taken her and she'll stay in the car and cry and she refuses to see his grave. 
she's still very affected by it. That was his baby. That was the little boy that she raised. When he was a baby, he slept with her. She was like attached to her. And he always asked for my mom. Even when he, when he went to Idaho, he got to talk to him sometimes. And it was unpredictable when Emmerich's dad would allow them to communicate. And then the last thing that he told my mom was that Emmerich would get very emotional and depressed every time he talked to her. So he didn't want him to get like that. So he told her that the best thing was that they didn't communicate anymore. So it had been several months since she talked to him when he passed because that's the last thing he told her that they couldn't control him after every time that they were on the phone he wanted his grandma and uh, my mom told me that every time she spoke to him he looked like he was scared that they were watching him because he was she would FaceTime with him and he looked scared like he was like threatened to not say things to her we could have never imagined that anything like that could be happening you know but we didn't know his stepmom. We didn't, I didn't, I never met her and I don't think my mom ever met her. We had no idea of who she was, but she posted all these things on social media about child abuse and stuff like that. Like she was a supporter and against it. And it was a lot of things, a lot of posts that she would always have something to say on social media. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know this lady, but she pretended to be an activist for child abuse. So it was kind of ironic that she did what she did. Right. It just seemed so hypocritical. She was so outspoken about it. And I remember seeing one of her posts about that and and thinking that, you know, a couple of years ago that it was just gross, you know, that she would post things like that and and then turn around and behave exactly that way to someone else's child. Yeah, exactly. It was very strange. Yeah. It was very strange because it always seemed like Mark's dad didn't want him. We knew that he didn't want him. So we asked for custody. We all wanted custody of him. But the system said that he had to go with the father. So fortunately, that's where he ended. But it wasn't because we didn't want him. Right. Because there were people in my family that petitioned to have custody of of him. My older brother did all the paperwork to adopt him. And at the end of the day, they told him that he couldn't adopt him, that he was going to go with death. You know, they have a, a real tendency to try to reunify families, even if there's many reasons not to. And he said, yeah, I, don't, I, I can't have him. I don't want him. And they're like, well, why are you giving him to him? He doesn't want to have a child. That's awful. And I I never heard anything from, from her. So I everything that happened was just so unexpected, so weird, so disgusting. I'm still in shock of everything that that I read that happened and like why there's probably a lot of things that you wish you didn't know yeah it's not that we try to avoid the subject but we know that that's not going to bring him back we know that having hatred in our hearts towards anybody is not going to bring him back that justice is going to be served I I am sure of that there's everything against us so I'm not worried about justice being served Right. Absolutely. You know that she's already going to prison for life and I can't imagine he's going to fare much better in October. So I have my fingers crossed that Emmerich and all of you get justice that you deserve. We've played it over and over again. We've talked about it. We had vigils. We prayed together as a family and we've talked to his family and asked them, like, did you see anything? Because we couldn't talk to him. He would avoid us. Did you guys notice anything? And they couldn't believe it themselves. I mean, who can? It's unthinkable. You wouldn't imagine, especially someone you're related to, could behave that way. And, of course, the pandemic really probably made everything worse since they were all locked in together and and he couldn't escape that woman. He's in a better place now. We believe that. Just hope that he knows how much his mom loved him, how much we loved him, how much his grandma loved him. I'm so sorry this happened to him and to all of you. It's an unthinkable loss, and I I just hope that you're all able to heal from it once the whole court process is over and you don't have to worry about hearing about that anymore. At this point, I don't think I want to know anymore. The more I find out, the more disgusted I become. 
the more negative I get about the whole thing because I'm like, I, I, I can't imagine anybody treating anybody like that, especially their own child. No, not at all. It's fortunate that they had cameras in the house, actually. But just the thought that they did that is just so strange. Yeah. But it's pretty surprising. When I'm telling these stories, there's a lot of people who have cameras in their homes like that for reasons like watching the child's behavior or whatever. Yeah, that's strange. I don't know if it's because it's tolerated in some cultures that you have to discipline your kids by hitting them or anything like that. I think it's something that at some point it's glamorized, you know, hitting your kid with the belt. The Like in the Hispanic culture, hitting your kid with the chancla or something, it's tolerated because that's how everybody was raised that's how people in the past did it so i feel like people don't realize that that mentality is what's killing our children that's killing our future generations and some people don't know how to control that it's normalized and then some people take it to the extreme and they think that the more abuse they give their child the more they're gonna learn or you're not gonna eat today because you gotta learn you gotta learn to be tough i just hate that and I hope that we change that. Definitely. I mean, that's a big reason that I do this, to try to get the word out, to try to make people understand how often it happens and how the signs can appear from the outside. Because I think there's a lot of things that people wouldn't think to look for. And it is difficult telling these stories, but not only do the kids deserve to be remembered for who they were, not just what happened to them, but also we can learn from it and hopefully save other children from going through the same things. I appreciate your mission. It's very selfless, very brave to have that purpose in life. And I admire you and I'm very grateful for everything you're doing. Thank you. I, I just would always see that this was happening and no one was talking about it. And I just didn't understand why. I mean, now I understand it's hard for people to hear it. It's hard for me to hear about it myself. But if we don't know about it, then we won't know what to look for. We won't know how to intervene if we need to. So it is important. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about Emmerich. And it's so important to hear from people who love them about who these kids were and the things they loved and the people they loved. And it means so much to know that much more about him. Thank you. Thank you so much to Irene for talking to me about her sweet nephew and letting us know a little more about who Emmerich was as a person. Emmerich Osuna should have turned 10 the month after his death. He should be turning 12 this October, enjoying middle school with his friends and cracking up his classmates. Emmerich has been described as a funny, loving, incredibly smart child whose smile and personality could light up a room. Family members said Emmerich loved grilled cheese sandwiches. He had a talent for building things and putting things together. Emmerich was a big fan of Transformers, superheroes, and ninjas. He also loved hugging and kissing his family members. Emmerich endured some of the worst abuse I've ever heard, but he deserves to be remembered for who he was, not what happened to him. Rest well, Emmerich. We'll never forget you. My sources for this episode were KTVB7, Idaho Press, Idaho News, The Daily Mail, KIVI-TV Idaho News 6, Facebook, The U.S. Sun, People, Dignity Memorial, GoFundMe, the Idaho iCourt Portal, ABC7, the Idaho Statesman, Me Too, Cafe Mom, Law and Crime, East Idaho News, the Spokane Spokesman Review, Patch.com, NBC Los Angeles, New Santa Ana, and the Ada County Jail Inmate Search. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. 
View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.